Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good evening to respected speakers and fellow audience. Welcome to SDG as far as the Youth Can See webinar organized by Global Community Service, GLOCOS, 9th Residential College, University Malaya. Before we begin to bless the ceremony, let's reset together Surah Al-Fatiha. Amin, Ya Rabbal Alamin. Ladies and gentlemen, Glucos is an association that carries out volunteer activities under the management of JKP Welfare and Community, Tun Said Zahiruddin Residential College, University Malaya. SDG, as far as the Youth Can See webinar, are held to provide disclosure to the community about Sustainable Development Goals, SDG. Our objectives are to give exposure to the public about SDG, to create awareness to the societies about the problems and current issues, and giving the community an overview of the steps to achieve SDG. Without further ado, let's welcome Glocos Program Director, Alma Atin Bakari, to give an opening speech and remarks. All right, thank you so much, Aina, for the short and sweet introduction. Good evening to all. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today. On behalf of the Global Community Service Project, or what we like to call ourselves, GLOCOS, I am thrilled and so excited for today's webinar, SDG, as far as the youth can see. Just to give all of you a little bit of background to our project, GLOCOS is an international volunteering project under the 9th Residential College of University Malaya. Before the pandemic, we went through various places across borders, such as Kampung Cham, Phuket, Aceh, and Yogyakarta, just to name a few. However, COVID-19 had different plans for us. Just as the pandemic had impacted the world in many different ways, our project also needed to change the way we've organized our initiatives. Hence, we've decided to completely revamp our direction and focus on the basis of igniting change, which was and is to increase awareness of social issues. Recognizing this, we decided that our aim this year was to increase realization and inspire young minds to initiate call to action regarding the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Agenda. Today, SDG, as far as the youth can see, is one of the few efforts we have in place to achieve our aim. I cannot even begin to express my gratitude to all those involved in making this event a success. To Dr. Azam and Enche Ashraf, Chairperson of KK9 and Supervisor of Glucos, respectively. Thank you for supporting and supervising the entirety of our project. To PM Care, thank you for sponsoring us and providing your unwavering support. To Ayn, Head of the Welfare Department of KK9, thank you for always being open with our ideas and giving your suggestions to enhance the impact of our initiatives. To the speakers, I am so, so grateful and so excited to have you on board for tonight's session. Dr. Zul, Jasmine, and Karin, you have inspired me in many different ways. And I'm sure that with the charisma you all have within you, this inspiration will spread to all those watching today. Last, but definitely not the least, to the team behind everything, members of GLOCOS. I am out of words to express how much your efforts have moved me. These past few weeks have been hard on most of us due to exams and assignments, but all of you have never failed to give your 100%, and all of this would have never been able to happen without each and every one of you. To the viewers, you have an amazing session coming up, so stay tuned. Thank you. Over to you, Aina. Thank you, Alma. Dear audience, please stay until the end as we will release Google Form for Certificate and QR Code for Merit. Now to end the week, please welcome our moderator for tonight, Isa Akila, to start the sharing session. Thank you, Ms. Aina. A very good evening to our special guests and our amazing audience. Welcome to sharing session for SDG, as far as the youth can see, organized by Glocos 9 Residential Police, University Malaya. Hello everyone, I'm Isa Akila, your moderator for tonight. Without wasting any time, let's get to know our very special speaker for tonight. We have Dr. Zul Iham. Dr. Zul, maybe you can introduce yourself a little bit of your background.
everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, I would like to thank the following host. Okay, uh, next maybe we have, can, can we have Carrie Lokman, the president of Hunger Hurts Malaysia. Can you introduce yourself a little bit? Hi, hi everyone. It's really good to be here today. Um, thanks to the Glucose team for organizing this. I think it's a really great initiative um, from the students of UM. Um, so uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Corinne Lokman. I'm the current president of uh, Hunger Hurts. We are an NGO that is striving to end poverty, not just in Malaysia, but also throughout Southeast Asia. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Looking forward to have a great session with all the speakers as well. Thank you. We're also pleased to have you uh, tonight. So finally, we have Ms. Uh, Jasmine Irisha, who is Climate Change Advocate and Climate and Environmental Consultant at UNICEF. Uh, what about you? Maybe you can introduce yourself a little bit. Thank you so much, Isa. Hi, everyone. Um, Happy good evening. Thank you so much for joining um, on this lovely Saturday. My name is Jasmine um, and I, my background is in environmental science and climate change. And I'm currently the uh, climate and environment consultant at UNICEF Malaysia. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, now we have to know about the speakers. Let's write into the questions. So for the first question, a brief one uh, intended to all three speakers, what was a turning point in your life that inspired you to do what you're doing right now? Um, how about you, Dr. Zul? Um, Clearly. What was a turning point in your life that inspired you to do what you're doing right now? So can you hear, can everyone hear me clearly uh, right yes. now? Yes. I think just now we have a technical glitch, right? Okay, thank you, Iza. Assalamualaikum and good evening, everyone. I owe this experience from the opportunity to live in Kyoto, Japan, for six years during my postgraduate study, thanks to Panasonic Scholarship. When I first arrived to Japan, I experienced culture confusion, culture shock. I suddenly become aware of the spotlessly clean Japanese streets, despite an absence of trash bins. How children as young as six years old made their way to school on their own and most importantly, how green and sustainable many aspects of the Japanese lifestyle when compared to other countries. As an example, we can see how the Japanese take recycling or recycuru seriously or very seriously. While we in Malaysia even struggle to separate our trash here, almost every household in Kyoto have to separate 12 different recycling categories. And they have this different color of waste bag for different categories. If the wrong thing is placed in the wrong bag, local authorities will put a red sticker of shame on your bag and everyone in the neighborhood, the whole street, all the obachang will know that you hate the planet. So in addition, in Kyoto, they also have this Kyoto City unwanted goods recycling system where you can advertise things that you don't use anymore and you can give them for free or you can sell for not more than 10,000 yen. Uh, that is around RM400. So I could say, Iza, that living in Japan has changed my perspective uh, towards sustainability. Thank you, Dr. Zul. That's a very eye-opening story from Japan. Maybe next we can have uh, Jasmine to share what you inspired. Uh, thanks, Iza. And thanks, Dr. Zul, for sharing that story. That was really inspiring. Uh, for myself, I wouldn't say that I have one particular turning point. I feel that in the span of uh, my journey, I had um, little, little uh, mini turning points along the way that sort of um, developed my sense of appreciation towards nature and sort of, um, you know, take something within me to um, take action um, against these environmental issues. I think by the nature of myself growing up uh, when I was younger, um, I grew up uh, and I spent a lot of time with my grandparents um, and my grandfather um, was a forester at FRIN, which is the Forest Research Institute of Malaysia. 
Um, and every other weekend, he will bring uh, me and my sister uh, to the forest um, and we'll have picnic, we'll play badminton, or we'll go to the waterfall. Um, and that's how we bond uh, with each other. Um, and I guess along the way, um, that sort of um, got me exposed uh, to nature. And when I was in school, um, I got myself actively involved in environmental related related competitions um, and I have been um, advocating for the environment ever since I was 14 years old um, and that sort of um, I guess uh, led me towards uh, what I wanted to pursue in my university uh, which is a degree in environmental science um, and after university I got involved uh, with a youth climate NGO called the Malaysian Youth Delegation um, so within this uh, youth delegation, uh, I have organized a lot of training series, partake in a lot of um, events and regional conferences, and I also had the privilege and opportunity to attend the uh, UNFCCC COP conference, um, uh, COP22 in Marrakech, that was back in 2016. Um, and when I was there as a youth representative um, representing Malaysia, um, it really exposed me um, and I gained a lot of experience in terms of international negotiations um, and I could really see the divide between countries within the global north and the global south. Um, and within that, just narrowing it down, like, and you, you can really see the injustice that happens uh, between um, developing country versus developed countries. Um, and that sort of fired uh, the fuel within me to learn further about um, international collaborations, um, relations, and also governance. And how do we sort of scope it down um, at a national scale, at a local scale, um, knowing that um, in terms of uh, climate change events um, and also environmental issues. Thank you, uh, Jasmine. Nice. Uh, finally, we have Karin to maybe a little bit Tell us what inspired him to be in environmental field. Thanks, Isa. Um, Jasmine and Dr. Zul, that was uh, amazing stories that you shared. Um, Isa, I have to correct you a bit. I'm not really in the environmental field. I'm more towards the poverty field. Um, so I'll be more than happy to share, you know, the inspirations or the, you know, the stories that led me to where I am today. So I'm doing a few things, actually. Um, I'm the current president of Hunger Hurts. I'm also part of, um, I co-founded DevEx, which is sort of a sister organization to Hunger Hurts. It's more towards the social enterprise side where we prioritize education, um, equal education for all students, you know, not just the B40, but, you know, all students all across Malaysia. Um, in terms of a turning point, I would, I would say that there's no specific spark or no specific turning point as well. Um, to me, I think uh, there's no one moment in my life that defined where I should be today or how I should you know, see the future. It's more towards um, ongoing proactive thinking on how I can you know, further improve myself, further improve the situations around me. But perhaps one story I could share is uh, my experience previously with the UNHCR. So UNHCR is the refugee, um, is the UN body. Um, that is related to refugees. So I was previously attached to the UNHCR in Malaysia a few years back when I was still studying, actually. I was an intern there. Um, the goal for me, you know, basically to, to intern in the UNHCR is basically just to see the situation of refugees in Malaysia. You know, we, we hear people talk about refugees every day, but we, we don't actually know what happens, you know, behind the scenes or how they're actually facing life. So... I decided to myself, I, I told myself, you know, let's give it a shot. Let's um, join the UNHCR on an internship, see what uh, that could bring me, you know. And my experience with the UNHCR was, is, was really eye-opening, to, to say the least. Um, I was involved in the outreach and protection department, meaning this department was the department that mainly interacted with the refugees that faced troubles. Um, face troubles in terms of the UN documentation, if they were, you know, facing troubles regarding the law. So with this, I, I had a really good chance to actually see what is happening on the ground, you know, what they're actually facing, what these refugees are actually facing. And, and it was really eye-opening. The, the, the challenges that they face every day is it's totally different from what, you know, someone like me or someone like my colleagues, you know, would face. Um, 
after that, I, I still had this burning desire inside of me to, to, to know more about people in poverty, you know, not necessarily refugees, but maybe the B40 as well, you know, the homeless people, people in urban poverty. So I joined a few student bodies. I joined, you know, several NGOs, which led me all the way um, to where I am now, to Hunger Hurts, basically. And, and yeah, even with Hunger Hurts, we are continuously organizing initiatives, continuously organizing projects, not just to shed light on poverty, not just to eradicate poverty, but also to, you know, advocate on the stories of the people who are actually suffering poverty, you know, what they're facing, what challenges um, that they face on a day-to-day -day basis, how we can help them further. And, and I would say it's, it's been a fulfilling experience and there's, it's, there's still a long way to go. So hopefully, you know, we can achieve more in the future. Now that question one has been answered by all the speakers, now let's move on to the next questions that will be answered by Dr. Zoe. So Dr. Zoe, <laughs> in order to educate sustainable and responsible consumers and to promote sustainable habits, key pedagogical approaches in SDG on the topic of sustainable consumption will have to be implemented. So the question is, uh, in your opinion, what are the key approaches needed to be implemented in tertiary level education in order to achieve this? Okay, Isa. Uh, all of us know that we are currently living in a consumption economy where both individual and corporate consumption harms the environment with excessive food consumption, plastic packaging, and careless use of energy and other resources. So industry and commercial building, energy waste is everywhere. And we are fast spoiling our natural environment, which will have consequences in the future if it goes unchecked. So at university level or high school, I would recommend the SHIFT framework by UBC, University of British Columbia, and SHIFT, S-H-I-F-T. So it's an acronym uh, in order to help uh, campus uh, community to move into sustainable lifestyle. S is for social, social influence, social norms, social media. Uh, this is due to the fact that social factors are the most influential in terms of affecting sustainable consumer behavior. And it can shift consumers to be more sustainable. H, H for habits. Habits refer to behavior that have become automatic over time. And some habits are harmful to the environment. Others are beneficial. So intervention to break the repetition, such as penalties, uh, can disrupt bad habits. And incentive, on the other hand, can encourage repetition and can strengthen habits. I is for individual self. Concepts such as self-interest, self-consistency, and self-efficacy contribute to the effectiveness of sustainability efforts. F, S-H-I-F. So F is for feelings. Uh, negative emotions can lead to damaging consumption. Sometimes when we have uh, negative emotion, we tend to, to, to snack more, right? So positive emotions hopefully can lead to pro-environmental behaviors. T is for tangibility. We humans, we would like to see tangible output. Uh, and, but unfortunately, some sustainability outcomes are abstract, meaning you cannot see and touch it. So there is no personal ownership. So we must communicate clearly, concrete, and show local impacts of both unsustainable and sustainable action. I believe that by practicing SHIFT shift, uh, we could improve. Uh, the status of sustainability in campus. So let's shift to a sustainable lifestyle. Thank you, Dr. Zul. Actually, I didn't know about shift before. Now I know that actually every campus should apply this shift uh, terms. Okay, next we move on to Karin. The prospect of hunger and poverty is often overlooked in developed and developing countries when illiteracy issues like urban poverty are very prominent. Why is still still an issue? And within countries that still growing and achieving economic sectors, what step can we eradicate this while achieving the global goals? Thanks, Isa. Um, yeah, definitely poverty is, you know, it's really sad to see poverty 
still all around us, right? You know, you walk, you you drive in KL, for example, or any city in the world, for example, as advanced as it may be, you know, with driverless cars or or green energy or whatever, there there with there will still be an element of poverty. There will still be people, you know, homeless people uh, in on the streets, and it's it's really sad to see this still happening in you know it's it's twenty twenty one now, you know, so um. There are, there are lots of reasons I would say why poverty is still prominent. There could be um, inequality, lack of proper infrastructure, um, lack of proper education, and these are all highlighted in the UN's SDGs as well. You know, but perhaps what I can share from my own experience with hunger heads on why, um, on why or how we could improve, um, you know, reducing poverty, is um, maybe firstly by acknowledging that there is a problem, acknowledging that poverty exists and, and not just simply acknowledging that, yeah, poverty exists, you know, we might have to donate, you know, so-and-so amount or um, share so-and-so stories. Um, I think there's, there comes a time, you know, in, in, in every situation where proactivity plays a huge role and proactivity is something that um, myself and also my organisation, Hunger Hurts, we, we strive for. For hunger hurts, we strive to, you know, systematically reduce the rate of poverty or urban poverty um, using our three prong strategy. And these uh, three prong strategies, you know, it's it's we've been using it since we were formed. We've been helping or trying to help as many people as we can, and at the same time, not just help but provide a huge impact to the lives of our beneficiaries. So, you know, our first strategy is by the provision of basic necessities. You know basic necessities and, and daily essentials to our beneficiaries. This is more towards the um, immediate impact, you know, that it's not really long-term, it's more towards uh, we need help and we will, uh, you need help and we will provide it as soon as we can, um, whenever we can, you know, and we do have projects um, surrounding this initiatives, basic necessities. Our second strategy is by um, providing education, training, sustainable solutions to our beneficiaries. And this is more towards, um, you know, whereas the first strategy is towards the short term, this is towards the longer term, you know, because at the end of the day, as much as we try to help people get out of poverty, the only ones who can help themselves are, you know, themselves, you know. So we try to provide them with the tools, the knowledge, the know-how of, of how to get out of poverty um, by themselves. And it is very challenging, you know. It is very challenging, but it's something that... Um, We've been trying to um, implement more and more to get more people um, aware of, of this. And, you know, it's been quite a journey. And our third in strategy is towards the advocacy side, you know, the, the awareness side. I think people throw around the word um, awareness quite a lot these days, you know, like, oh, yeah, we have to raise awareness on this, we have to raise awareness on that. But, you know, that's good. But um, what's more important as well is to actually have, you know, uh, proper strategies, proper um, execution behind it. So for hunger hurts, you know, for what, what we try to do is we we really try to drill down on our beneficiaries. Like, what do you actually? How can we help you? What do you actually need? You know, um, and after that, we we also try to share their stories to to people to let them know how people in urban poverty are actually living. You know, I've I've been to a few PPRs. So PPRs are the low cost um, houses in Malaysia. I've been to some PPRs and, and you know, the, even the infrastructure there could be greatly improved further. But, but all in all, I would say that um, advocacy awareness could still be increased. And perhaps, to me at least, the most important thing about awareness is to actually meet the people who are in poverty, um, listen to their stories, listen to how you yourself can help them all, and sharing their stories, you know, sharing their stories with your friends. Um, brainstorm on how you can help them you know um not just with friends maybe perhaps with your student bodies with your organizations with even your workplace you know maybe there could be some csr possibilities you know to to get the word out to to help more and more people and at the end of the day provide the biggest impact to um, people actually suffering in poverty yeah thank you Kari. Uh, actually 
when I first uh, went to study in University Malaya, I never knew that there is a poverty case and homeless persons until I went to uh, volunteerism. And there is a lot of um, homeless cases there. And then actually it's a good point, uh, Karin, that um, we should spread more awareness on this case. So next question is actually for Dr. Zo and Jasmine. The majority of scientists agree that climate change is happening and largely due to peoples. However, there are some people who think that climate change is real despite the abundance of scientific evidence. So can you tell us how the environment and climate has changed in past five years or can you predict what will happen next five to 10 years? And what SDG could affect on reducing climate change and environmental risk in next 10 years? Maybe uh, Jasmine can go first. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Isa. Um, I think the question here is not so much addressing to, you know, there is still a large number of climate deniers out there because statistics show and there's a global consensus amongst climate scientists that climate change is real, it's happening, and it's happening at an unprecedented rate. I think the real question that we should be asking now is how fast are we taking climate action and how do we address climate inaction? Because climate inaction comes with a cost. Um, and we have witnessed more intensified climate patterns that have been happening in the past few years, past decade, and even recently. So for example, like the flooding that happens in that happened in the East Coast in January 2021, um, it, I'm sure you all still remember it affected greatly um, areas of uh, estates like Kuantan, Trungganu, and Johor, um, leaving 50,000 Malaysians displaced in the middle of a COVID pandemic. Um, and these are the climatic events. Um, we could say now it's still at a small scale and it's a sneak peek of what we can be expecting in the future. Um, and there's this ongoing um, discussion about uh, a triple threat, right? So when we talk about climate change, it's not specifically just focusing on climate change. We have to address external issues at hand, such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and also additionally, um, what we don't really see with our naked eye, which is the biological ecosystem collapse. Um, and these are all interlinked um, and we need to have solutions that address this intersectionally. So, when we talk about what's going on with climate change now is higher intensity and variability when it comes to precipitation and rainfall, meaning heavier rain, um, heavier floods. Um, and also this not only affect um, physical um, environment, but also it has a ripple effect um, in the sense that it will, it will affect our um, agriculture, food systems, livelihoods, and those depending um, on those to survive. And this will in turn affect the most uh, marginalized and vulnerable population the most. Um, for example, children, women, the poor, the B40, stateless, migrants, refugees, and also people, persons with disabilities. Um, there's just, you know, and we're talking on like a very national scale, very Malaysian scale, but um, even areas where are not where, where they're prone to natural disasters, such as a small island developing states. Um, people who are living um, on these small island developing states, their survival is at hand. It's climate crisis is for them an existential crisis. Um, this, this is where climate induced migration happens and we could already see it happening um, at, at small island nations such as Vanuatu and Kiribati, for example. Um, and then you have the question of F SDGs, right? The Sustainable Development Goals, very fancy, very cool, colorful framework that is set by the United Nations. We all know there are 17 SDGs. Uh, we also know, or probably not a lot of you know, there's about 169 um, targets and 232 uh, indicators. So it seems quite robust. It seems quite comprehensive. Like we have all these uh, mechanisms at hand, but when it comes to implementation, how do we truly implement it? How do we as an individual, or how are we as an individual as part as an institution or a network or organization adopt those framework and practices into our everyday practices, into our everyday lives? 
Um, so this is where, um, like, Tadi, uh, uh, Dr. Zul mentioned about the SHIP uh, framework um, and those uh, working um, at a grassroots level, at an NGO level, such as Hunger Hurts, um, coming to play, uh, playing a very important role in addressing these issues at hand. Um, and this is also where um, organizations, international organizations, as, as mentioned um, by Karin at UNHCR or MISA, for example, a couple of others in Malaysia, UNDP, um, who are looking closely um, into implementing this um, at a very local scale. Um, and just one more point before <laughs> Dr. Zo uh, can take over me is that uh, um, where do we see ourselves next? I, I think it's very clear um, if we've been following the Paris Agreement if we've been following um, the IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, we need to strive to achieve a 1.5 degree pathway to ensure that we have a safe, just, and sustainable future. If we are going at the rate that we're going now, if we're going uh, to do things uh, like business as usual right now, um, it will take us on a three to four degree pathway. Um, and you know, simply saying that pathway will really lead us to catastrophic events and future. Um, and we don't want that. Uh, so this is where um, young people like you, brilliant young minds studying at UAM KK9, uh, coming together tonight uh, to discuss um, and ask questions uh, and to come up with solutions to how do we actually address it. Um, I believe that each one of us has the responsibility um, because we will also want to ensure that um, we have the rights to a safe and healthy future. Um, over to you, Dr. Zoll. Thank you, uh, Jasmine. Uh, thank you, Iza. So I agree with Jasmine that it is not the matter of whether we believe in climate change or not. To tell you the truth, I am not good at predicting, but I work based on data and analysis. And in the past decade, research have shown that CO2 emissions from fossil fuel is increasing by 10%. And we even, uh, Jasmine mentioned just now, there are happenings due to anthropogenic effect, human-induced, the weather is changing. And I just read about uh, US National Weather Service forecasted that this upcoming week will be the hottest in the west coast of US. And excessive heat wave warning have been issued. So concentration of carbon dioxide too is now, currently, more than 400 parts per million. For millions of years before this decade, it never exceeds 400 parts per million. And the sea level rise of more than 1.6 inches, and, and you also read about Antarctic ice mass loss is more than ever, right? So all of these factors are interlinked and because climate change is not re, it's not a single factor it is contributed by interrelated factors that cause devastating extreme event heat wave record rainfall and flooding so on and so forth so to relate it with our topic today which is sdg uh, and jasmine already mentioned to us about the colorful 17 sgs right just now so i would like to share that last week prof jeffrey sachs announced the sustainable development report 2021 and malaysia ranked at number 65 65 out of 165 countries and you may check the performance of your respective countries online now. what i would like to highlight is that uh, this SDG index measure a country's total progress towards achieving all 17 SDGs. And I would like to highlight that Malaysia has successfully achieved one SDG, SDG 1, which is related to Karin today, no poverty. So thank you to Karin and the Hunger Hurts teams and uh, all, I believe all other NGOs and parties that are working uh, our government uh, towards uh, the success of this SDG. However, uh, we also have three goals which are on track to be achieved. SDG 7, which is affordable and clean energy. I'm happy to hear about this. SDG 8, decent work and economic growth, as well as SDG 9, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. The sad news, however, is that four goals are at a, at a stagnating score, namely SDG 4, education, SDG 13, climate action, SDG 14, life below water, and SDG 17, partnership for the goals. And one SDG sees that the score is decreasing. 
namely SDG 15, Life on Land. So all of these are indicators that there are more works to be done by us in order to achieve uh, SDG. The silver lining is that uh, in a research by UNDP and UNICEF, 9 in 10 young people in Malaysia have experienced environment and climate related effect in the last 3 years and 92% of young people think that climate change is a crisis so i can say that i have positive outlook towards the future because the young people in malaysia are believing in climate change so climate is changing and we must find ways to mitigate and adapt to it we must find ways on how to mitigate it meaning to reduce the adversity of this and adapt on how to live. Okay, thank you Dr. Zul for very deep explanations and thank you juga Jasmine. And before jumping to uh, our next questions, uh, a little info to our audience today. If you feel like you are too young to make a change, Greta Thunberg, an 80-year-old Swedish schoolgirl has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019 and has received the numerous prestigious awards. She initiated a process of mobilizing youth hundreds of cities in the world. She also listed in Times 25 most influential teens of 2018 and the first recipient born in 21st century who is the youngest recipient ever to receive the Times Person of the Year in 2019 by Time magazines. Just like Greta said, no one is too small to make a difference. So to all the youth out there who are in the audience tonight, you can write down your question in chat box so that we can have any of our speakers to answer them. Stay tuned until the end of our webinar as we will release a Google form and a QR code for you guys to get your e-certificate and merits. We will now be moving on to our next set of questions. Uh, this goes to Jasmine and Karin. So Jasmine actually has been advocate for climate action since young and has done abundance of initiative to promote sustainability. And Karin is the president of Hunger Hurts and worked for UNHCR and also recently co-founded an education platform for the youth. So uh, the question for you guys is, How do you think youth could play a part in change making to educate social issues within Malaysia so that we can come closer to achieving the sustainable development goals? Uh, maybe Karen can go first. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I think Dr. Zoh, that's really good to hear that, you know, out of all the SDGs, at least Malaysia is, you know, on track for poverty. <laughs> You know, still a ways to go, but hopefully we can achieve all the SDGs as well in the future. Um, so on the question of youth, um, I think uh, like like you highlighted, Isa, um, Gre Greta, you know, she's only she's still a teenager and she's making waves all across the world. You know, she's she's a global figure. Almost everyone she knows about her. She's a household name. So, um, in that sense, you're right. Uh, you're you're never too old or too young to um start uh start being a change maker you know anyone can be a change maker um in terms of of what youths can do uh there are plenty of things that youths can do um and i think it's 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 all a matter of proactiveness you know um how much do you want to be involved how much do you want to make a change um uh, when i was uh still a student, I, I tried my best to, um, you know, to be proactive. Uh, I wasn't always the most active student or the most, um, um, you know, uh, active student. And that's my my fault. If I could turn back time, I would try to do as much as I can when I was still a student, you know, join this, join that, um, volunteer here, volunteer there. And maybe not just in poverty, maybe in, in climate as well, you know, hearing what Dr. Zul and Jasmine are saying, it's, it's all really amazing initiatives that they are part of you know but um i think something that the youths can actively do for now is is just to um join more um student bodies join more ngos volunteer more and the reason being is because when you actually join organizations like this when you join bodies like this you get perspectives you can share perspectives with 
plenty of like-minded individuals, you know, and the SDGs, all 17 of the SDGs are on issues that are bigger than any one person can solve, you know, so it takes a collective mindset, uh, a mindset, you know, from, from brilliant individuals such as, you know, yourselves, you know, the students of UM, Dr. Zul, Yasmin, it takes brainstorming and, and it's really good to, to start, you know, networking to, to know more about um, how we can solve these issues. Um, so yeah, I would, I would say that it's a really amazing opportunity for youth to be more involved in um, NGOs, perhaps, um, any NGOs for that matter, regarding any um, goal, poverty, climate change, um, education. Um, from there, it's, it's easier for you to, you know, to plan ahead on, on how you can see yourself in five years, perhaps. Do I, do I want to go in this field or do I want to go in that field? Um, so, yeah, I would say planning starts now, execution starts now as well. And, and you never know, in five years, you could be the next um, Greta Thunberg. <laughs> Am I going next? It's me, right? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think just to expand on to that and to answer Isa's question, but before that, I kind of want to address um, Dr. Zoll's points earlier on. You just quoted, you know, very, very relevant report. Um, and just to share a bit, I previously worked at the Jeffrey Sachs Center on Sustainable Development at Sunway University. Um, and one of the key areas that I was focusing on on my research is particularly SDG 15, uh, which is where you said um, we're falling behind on quite a lot. Um, and the thing is in Malaysia, um, I think a couple of years ago, they, they published quite a similar report and they use a traffic light system. So basically to showcase the healthiness of the SDG index in Malaysia. Um, and under SDG 15, there was two very alarming um, red traffic light, I was, I was about to say red flags, but I think it, it can be considered red flags to go. Um, one is under biodiversity and one is under forest, right? Um, and those are the issues that are still persisting and, until today. If you see um, forest issues in Malaysia, for example, there, if you've been on social media and read about uh, it in the news, is the Kuala Langat North Forest Reserve um, and a whole uh, commotion when it comes to the uh, Gazette and the Gazette men um, uh, side of things. Um, so in terms of forest preservation and conservation, and then you also have the issue that um, we are falling behind in the biodiversity index as well. Um, in Malaysia, um, what is being advocated a lot in the conservation scene, uh, conservation scene um, are large uh, megafaunas. Uh, for example, one of the um, icons in Malaysia is the uh, tigers. Um, and we only have about 200 estimated Malayan tigers left in the wild. And that's just an estimation number. Um, experts say it could be so much more lower than that. Um, and then when it comes to uh, youth involvement or youth participation, um, I was directly involved in the UNDP UNICEF um, report, uh, the Change for Climate report. So last year, it was published in September 2020, where we conducted a national youth uh, climate change survey. Um, we sampled about 1,400 respondents um, from uh, young people across Malaysia. Um, and the key finding of that report is that 92% of young Malaysians think uh, that climate change is a crisis. So the awareness is somewhat there, right? But then when we narrow it down a bit further, we can also say that it's quite fragmented in the sense that uh, the, they are quite split at two ends of the spectrum. On one end, you have people, young people who are so active, who are out there making their own individual changes. Um, but on the other hand, you also have a group of Malaysian youth who are somewhat aware of climate change, uh, but they also feel really helpless or they don't know where to start. They feel anxious, but then they're like, um, yeah, I don't even know how to take the first step. Um, so this is where I feel um, organizations come into play, right? NGOs. Um, and Isa, you also asked earlier about like, what can young people do to take action, particularly in SDGs or SDG areas that they are interested in? Um, and Karin pointed out really good points um, on where to start. So start by joining organizations or networks in university. I volunteered a lot in university and I think um, 
I, I, I really enjoyed my time in the sense that I participated a lot, um, not just uh, volunteering or participation in NGOs, but also taking opportunities in like um, exchange programs. Uh, so for example, one of the um, exchange programs that really was eye-opening for me was the YCE program, the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative. Um, I went on the environmental issues track. Um, it was really fun. Uh, we spent about five weeks in the States. Um, and I think uh, they, they have an open application now if you could just Google them up um, online. Um, and we have a lot of local events as well um, or um, online presence such as um, the Malaysian Youth Delegation, Kami, Klima Action Malaysia, Project Youth, a lot of vibrant young um, organizations uh, just popping up here and there and really taking advantage of social media. Actually, I, I found out a lot about Hunger Hurts through social media, through Twitter and Instagram. You guys have such amazing advocates um, and very cool members uh, just retweeting and tweeting uh, stuff online. Um, yeah, and, and also like, you know, a lot of people ask me, right? Like Jasmine, do we need Malaysian Greta Thunberg? And honestly, I would say no, because I feel like we already have a lot of existing young Malaysians who are so proactive, so vocal, and are the, on the front line of climate activism. We have young people like Ili Nadia, like Ideal Iman, like Amalina Arifin, who are already utilizing their online presence, their social media platform, to really convey the message and the urgency of the climate crisis. And I believe that each individual's lived experience is very different than one another, and everyone experienced the impacts of climate change differently. Um, and we should not undermine those lived experience, and we should acknowledge and take it at hand, um, not just amplify their voices, but give them space and give them the platform to share about their experience, uh, to speak out, and to also help people take climate action uh, in the future. Uh, thank you, Jasmine and Karin. It's, it's a very, such a good point, actually. Because before this, before I entered university, I don't know anything about SDG, zero knowledge about SDG. But since I entered university, I start to join events and volunteerism. I starting to know what SDG is. And actually, joining events and NGOs actually really give me a platform to know more about SDGs and how to trying to achieve them. And actually, if there is any audience out there, if you have feel helpless and do not know how to starting to um, achieving the starting to help to achieving the SDG, maybe you can start to uh, join organizations or any events. Okay, um, next. <laughs> Next, we'll be ending with a short questions for all three speakers and with all the substance and the key points that you have mentioned tonight. Where and how do you think that youth can start and achieve SDG and meet the global goals? Maybe, um, Dr. Zul. Okay, Isa, thank you. Uh, I will also would like to. Uh, informed that I'm also part of YZ Lee, uh, which uh, Jasmine has oh, wow. just mentioned, <laughs> but on the elder spectrum of professional fellows program uh, of the YZ Lee, Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative uh, in 2017, uh, I had a chance. So I would like to echo Jasmine and Karin's suggestion, encouraging all young people to participate. Take the first step and make your voice heard using the right platform, NGOs, education, network, so that we could get a seat at the table. This is important because the way the world engage young people today on critical issues like climate change will determine the prospects for our planet. Youth bring incredible drive and commitment to change things for the better. The world must utilize young people's potential as powerful agents of change, involve and empower us in the development of policies and support our participation in climate actions at all levels. Why did I say that we need a seat at the table? Because it is interesting to note that the world will have the largest youth population over the next few years. Leaving young people out of the table of discussion is frankly not very sensible. 
probably not possible. So everyone start shifting your lifestyle. So young people must live more sustainable today and be heard. As young people show everyone that we are concerned about the environment and please include us in the decision that is going to shape our shared future. This conversation must go beyond the urban center and gather youth from rural and lower income areas who are already practicing climate action initiative in their own culture. I believe that it, this is our opportunity to reimagine a greener and more sustainable future for everyone. So maybe Karin and Jasmine, as the real young people, could elaborate more. Thank you. Okay, next, Karin, maybe you can answer the questions. Sure. Um, yeah, I think um, this is an end, this is an end note. Um, um, well, firstly, thanks, Jasmine, for pointing out that you've learned a lot about Hunger Heads through social media. Um, you know, the marketing team in, in Hunger Heads has been doing such an amazing job, you know, the past two years, ever since COVID started, just to get word out on how to help, you know, the B40 people, how to be more involved in our um, initiatives. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really impressive effort by the whole team of Hunger Heads, which, again, is currently comprised of youths, you know. So I think this is a good segue to say that um, be proactive, um, start asking questions, start, um, um, you know, um, joining societies, not just as a member, but also maybe as someone who, who takes charge of projects, you know, takes charge of, um, comes up with initiatives, comes up with projects. And you learn a lot. You you learn a lot about yourself as well. And it's, I would say it's, it's there's, there's nothing to lose and plenty to gain. Uh, you can go next, that's me. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I, I think young people have, in, have an advantage because we are such a, at such a position where we are allowed to be vocal um, try new things, uh, make mistakes, learn from them, um, and hopefully not to make that mistake again. But then again, you know, just looking at the timeline, the Sustainable Development Goals, they have a timeline of 2030. 2030 is actually not that far away. I mean, we're already in 2021. It's less than a decade away. Um, so we're actually on a race against time. Um, and this is where I feel, um, you know, to acknowledge our own responsibility in taking care of this one place we call home, because frankly speaking, we don't really have any other place to go. Um, and I truly believe that uh, we should all take action and do what we can within our own capacity. I know sometimes that when you think about global issues, poverty, environmental issues, climate change, it can get a bit overwhelming. Um, there's even a term coined after it, right? It's called eco-anxiety, where you just feel a bit helpless about what's going on with the world today. Um, and that is valid, that is justified. Um, but along that line, um, you know, when it comes to taking action, uh, you have to believe that there are others who are with you. There are others who are in solidarity with you. Um, then there are also others that could support you. So this is where points that was um, really emphasized by Karen is be proactive, um, join organizations, join certain networks, and don't be afraid to demand action from our policymakers, from our leaders. Those who have already announce their commitments, those who are already make statements, we should hold them accountable because at the end of the day, it's our future as well. Um, there's also this term um, at the international um, agenda that is called intergenerational equity, which means that um, responsibility towards our future generation, taking into account um, what has been made in the past so with that being said, I think it is important for us to realize where we stand now. Um, we are in a place that we can demand for our rights to a safe and healthy environment in the future. Um, and Isa, I, I feel like I need to share this with you that everyone starts somewhere. Um, I started um, in university, you know, just out of pure frustration. Um, because um, one of the earlier projects that I did before I went full on environmental advocacy mode is that I just implemented a simple bicycle project in my university. 
because I was so frustrated that we don't have enough parking spaces in university and that the bus, uh, bus service was so unreliable. Um, but then again, that is where collaboration comes in, really um, you know, pushing forward what you're passionate in, uh, working together with the university management, working together with the student council, working together uh, with your peers and your classmates. Um, that is where true change actually comes in. And that is where you can make a difference within your own capacity before branching out even more. Okay, thank you to all the speakers. That's a very such a great uh, answers. So now let's move on to the Q&A session from the audience. Dear audience, uh, feel free to drop your question in the chat. We will have a few questions from you. Also, don't forget to fill in the forms and scan QR code at the end of our webinar to get your e-certificate and merits. So the first question is um, by Beda. The questions are meant for Mr. Karin. Why did Hunger Hurt's recent program focus on Sabah? Why Sabah? Thanks, Beda, for your question. Um, well, Hunger Hurts, we, are, we aim to be a national level organization, meaning that we, we plan to help the whole country, you know, not just Sabah, not just KL, not just Kira, you know, but the whole country. You know? And being a youth organization, being a small organization that we are right now, what's really important to us when we um, initiate our projects is uh, manpower, you know. So currently, we our manpower is of, is of course focused in, in Kuala Lumpur, where the bulk of our members are. So most of our projects are focused in Kuala Lumpur. But we also have members or volunteers who are, you know, who, who help us all over Malaysia as well. And Sabah in particular, Sabah is um, one of the poorest states in Malaysia, the infrastructure in Sabah is actually very, very, um, very, very lacking, I would say, as compared to Semenanjung, Malaysia, you know. And for Sabah, the, uh, the initiatives that we involved in are basically to provide basic necessities, provide food packs to the families in poverty in Sabah. And, you know, just seeing the photos from Sabah, just seeing how the people in Sabah are facing lives, it's, it's really, again, very eye-opening. Um, you know, especially seeing that most of these families, they live in the, you know, in the pedalaman, you know, it's, it's not in the city or not, um, it's not easily accessible. Most of the times when our members have to go there, they have to access these um, villages by boat, you know, followed by a further um, uh, off-road tracking or whatever. So, so it's, it's, it's really difficult to get there, but we are very lucky to have members, volunteers in Sabah as well to help us initiate all these projects. Um, but to answer your question, why Sabah? Um, so again, Sabah is a poor state. We have members there, and 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 I guess I guess it's not a question of why Sabah. It's a question of um, when can we do more states? You know, when can we do Sarawak? When can we do Kedah, Ipoh, Kelantan? You know, and of course that's the goal. So hopefully, a year from now, two years from now, it's not just Kuala Lumpur and Sabah. It's it's all states that we can help. Uh, make an impact with. Okay, thank you, Kari. So next question is from uh, Amara Kamara. SDG goals are to be balanced as per developed countries' views on SDG taking all into account. Does the viewpoint of developed countries be a direct reflection relative to developing countries? Maybe uh, Jasmine can answer these questions. Yeah, sure, I'll try, but I'm not sh so sure I got the question right. Uh, but just to elaborate a bit more on the SDG goals, um, as I mentioned earlier, SDG goals are supposed to be a framework, right? A framework that it is agreed by a hundred and a bit over 190 countries um, at, at the uh, United Nations level for them to implement um, and take back to their own countries and implement them at a local level. And this was an extension uh, from the previous um, version, which is the Millennium Development Goals. Um, and of course, um, when we talk about it from a global north, a global south perspective, or the developed versus developing countries perspective, um, comparable with the Paris Agreement, 
um, that the global, uh, global North or the developed countries have an advantage at implementing this further and more successfully as compared to the developing countries, purely because they have the technology, they have the finance, and they also have the capacity to implement it. Um, now, turning the tables around um, from a developing country's perspective, um, not just, and, and again, uh, to achieve the SDGs um, and also the Paris Agreement, uh, we really need to reevaluate our country's uh, national climate commitment when it comes to implementation and also the vision of uh, where our countries are at at the current moment. Uh, but comparatively, again, um, and I mentioned this earlier, the timeline for SDG is quite tight. 2030 is the deadline. Uh, are we going to have another big UN conference in 2030 to reevaluate if SDG is successful? We don't know. But what we know is that if we don't take fast and rapid action now, there will be consequences in the future. Um, and although it is just a framework, it is a framework for a reason, uh, which is why like, even if you look at much like, our local scale, our local agenda, like different cities, we all have um, at, a at a city wide scale or a statewide scale, um, a low carbon target or a low carbon pathway um, to really address uh, the sustainable development goals at hand and to also implement it um, at a local level so that um, we could all have a shared um, uh, sustainable cities um, and livable states. Yeah. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, Dr. Zhu, do you want to add something? So maybe I will add a little bit. Uh, of course, uh, when you mention whether these uh, metrics actually give a direct reflection for de developing countries, of course, there are advantages like what Jasmine mentioned to developed countries. However, Malaysia is now categorized at the upper economic level of the developing countries. We are considered no more uh, middle income countries. Therefore, uh, but we are not yet a uh, developing economy. This is actually very vague and very troublesome for us. Why I, I would say this is that well, the time when I grew up after undergraduate study or after high school, uh, we could easily have scholarship to support students to go abroad. Like as myself, after undergraduate, we still have Panasonic scholarship uh, at that time to support me to go to Japan to study. And later on uh, for my PhD, we have JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency. Both of these scholarship are not available now. Why? Because we are already at the upper echelon of the uh, developing countries. Therefore, you guys are, uh, are not being offered the same scholarship. That is how uh, we could easily see uh, where we are in the economic level, meaning we don't receive aid from other countries anymore in order to send students for studies. And we also upgraded our education system at par with uh, global uh, education uh, as far as we are concerned. Therefore, in order for us to break, we are currently hitting the ceiling and we would like to break uh, it and be become a developed country. So we need we, we couldn't just uh, let it go and leave everything unchecked. We should meet the metrics, try to see whatever parts that we could improve so that we could fit into this, the description of a developed economy. Other than that, we couldn't really break the ceiling and we will still be at the gray area between developed economy and also developing countries, which is really unfortunate because you couldn't really uh, have all the advantages of developing countries and you also didn't improve the livelihood of your people to become developed economy. So uh, it's something that we have to think about young people because uh, the future, like what Jasmine mentioned, SDG is just until 2030 and it's just nine years ahead, which is 
not far ahead. And with all this COVID-19, we are now bound at home, right? So we should think about it and we should try to meet the metrics that are available by the SDG and not just leave everything unchecked. That is my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Zul and Jasmine. So for the next questions from Nabila Mahmoud, how do you we use a COVID-19 situation to benefit and achieve SDG in our country? Is this an open question? Yes. Okay, I mean, I can go first. Um, and Dr. Zol and Karin, feel free to respond after me. Um, when it comes to COVID-19, I mean, COVID-19 is a global pandemic. Um, when we talk about addressing COVID-19 uh, from a national perspective, it's always um, putting our health first. Um, and scaling down to a very individual approach, um, we should all take care of ourselves um, and also very respectfully respect the SOPs that are being put in place. Um, and being mindful of that, there are also various of other things that we can do from home um, to achieve this SDG targets and goals. I personally have been working from home ever since last year and I work like normal. Um, and I, I haven't really spoke about uh, what UNICEF does uh, before this, so I'm just gonna chip in a bit. Um, so UNICEF, uh, we look at things from a children's rights perspective, um, and uh, we just uh, established a climate and environment portfolio just about a year now. Uh, so what we do is we look at climate change impacts and environmental degradation impacts and how it affects specifically um, children's health, um, children's environmental health in terms of this um, external um, climatic events. Um, and I talked a bit about children's rights to a healthy environment earlier because it's actually at the forefront of what we do. Um, and just a reflection of like SDGs and climate change in relations with COVID-19 um, to reiterate, everything is interrelated. Um, but what we're looking at now, even though if you have read um, that, you know, uh, carbon emissions uh, have actually dipped a bit at the start uh, when COVID-19 happened, uh, we must not forget that COVID-19 also happened because of interference with nature, such as wildlife trade um, and also zoonotic diseases. Um, and also bearing in mind of that, uh, what we're looking at now is just a dip within the system. It's not even a dent. Um, it does not affect greatly when it comes to carbon emission reduction because a lot of our um, operations are still ongoing um, and it does not affect on a long-term scale. And we, when we talk about climate change, it's a long-term scale, uh, not, not concerning directly to uh, short-term uh, weather pattern changes. Uh, so I think that is something that we should keep in mind, um, but also do what you can, uh, reduce plastic waste. I know a lot of us buy online shopping at Shopee every day, we get parcels at our doorstep. Um, if we could just be a bit mindful of the, of the grab that we <laughs> order or the food that we tap out, um, if uh, we can, uh, I think that's a good first step, uh, but also, um, you know, just with what, everything that's going on today, uh, please take care of yourself uh, and your health first, um, and then we can think about other things. Yeah, I think that's a great point by, by Jasmine as well. Um, you know, how, how can we benefit from COVID-19? Well, everyone is suffering from COVID-19 one way or another, you know, in terms of livelihood, in terms of work operations, in terms of, you know, just general well-being. Um, but one thing that the pandemic has forced us is, you know, to be locked in our houses, you know, to be working from home. And this also forces us to be more innovative in how we approach um, solutions and how we approach problems. Um, the SDGs, maybe the ones that are related to hunger hurt, um, no poverty, and also um, better education, you know, we've had to crack our brains on how can we actually uh, continue providing impact to our beneficiaries throughout the pandemic. And 
And I think without the pandemic, um, you know, as bad as it is, we might not have been able to come to some of the solutions that we've um, reached for education, for example. Everyone is now forced to um, be part of online learning, you know, and with Hunger Hurts, we've, we've did projects to um, provide laptops to the B40 community, you know, with DevEx, we've try to pr provide a platform for online learning. And before this, I would say online learning is something that is very, you know, very alien to Malaysians, you know? Even the ICT class in schools is something that is uh, more of an afterthought rather than a, a proper curriculum. So I think with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, it's hard to see the benefits, but it's really good to force ourselves to be more innovative in our thinking on how to approach um, problems. Uh, I would like to echo uh, Karin's uh, suggestion or Karin's opinion about uh, we should try to be innovative uh, despite of the COVID-19 challenges. Uh, what I would like to say is that COVID-19 has become an eye-opener to show to us actually to reveal inequalities in certain parts of the country or even the world. We can actually see really clearly for example like education we can see areas that could not be reached that are out of uh, online services right so we can also see people who could uh, who are not accessible by vaccines for example right so it will encourage and it should encourage us to be more innovative for example uh, we used to have these meetings where we have to travel and drive all the way across cities in order to attend one meeting. So now we realize that the travel is actually unnecessary. We could do it online. So people can attend it and we can reduce the carbon footprint. And uh, during COVID-19 too, we, we, all of, most of us work from home meaning there are less cars on the road. So maybe it's time for us to experiment uh, driverless car or maybe uh, fuel efficient cars or electric cars, right? And we will also be innovative in order to reduce our electricity uh, utilization at home because everybody is at home, uh, switching on uh, their laptops and air conditioner and, and all. Right? And I also agree with Jasmine uh, that we have to reduce our single-use plastic consumption. So we will come with creative ideas on how to reduce it. So we have to be innovative, take part. We started uh, gardening in our lawn, right? I can see people sharing on Facebook. Those are really good apart from uh, the challenges that we see due to the COVID-19. So... I know to change behavior is really difficult, but it is hope that we learn something from this COVID-19 and it will empower us uh, to be able to mitigate and manage disaster uh, better uh, in the future. That's all for me. Thank you, speakers. So um, next question from Kasturi Arjunan. Is a low carbon development market a green market model? Does this lead to a win-win situation for the sustainable development goals? I can jump in on that. Um, definitely a low carbon pathway is the way of the future. If we look at right now, a lot of companies or a lot of um, sectors are announcing that they're moving towards a net zero model, a net zero carbon pathway, a net zero target. But what does that actually mean? Um, so it's nice that you're announcing all these plans and targets, but also um, at the same time, we need to see it through the implementation stage. And we, when you talk about low carbon development market or like a green market model, um, I understand that there's going to be a shift um, in uh, energy usage or a shift in systemic model. Um, so we could not, like I said again, we cannot go business as usual. Um, there needs to be a shift um, with uh, the energy that uh, market that we're looking at. So for example, like right now, um, 
what constitutes most towards our carbon emission in Malaysia, 80% is from the energy sector, followed by waste, followed by agriculture. So how do we actually make that transition from a very high intensity carbon emission uh, pathway towards a low carbon emission pathway using a rapid decarbonization model? Um, and this is also where we also need to think about not just shifting on the energy market, um, within sectors, but also looking at how it affects uh, vulnerable groups of population. So we want to know when we make that shift, when we make that transition, um, are the workers, our employees, um, is their job safe? Um, will they be able to adopt the greener or newer market system? Um, how are our young people nowadays, are they equipped with the correct skills or correct knowledge to work on this alternative uh, sector? Um, and in a couple of years time, we won't even be talking about green jobs because the jobs are going to be already green. That's, that's, that's a pathway that we're looking at right now. Um, and again, reflecting back on the population, there's this term called just transition, which means that when we transition away uh, from a fossil fuel intensive um, energy sector towards a more alternative um, green energy sector, um, how do we ensure the safety net um, of um, the population, um, specifically looking at um, a, uh, a perspective from ensuring um, a just or a safe environment for all these marginalized uh, populations, such as the indigenous groups, children, women, uh, workers, um, and also um, others. Um, so I'll stop there. <laughs> and I'm sure Dr. Zo and Karin have more to add on to this. Oh, Karin, not me. Okay, I'll go first. Go ahead, okay. Uh, yeah, I agree with Jasmine that we should not neglect uh, our aim in order to achieve this uh, low carbon market. Uh, actually, our country is also uh, having its own framework, uh, which is called low carbon cities framework. Uh, but in my personal opinion, due to the recovery uh, from COVID-19, uh, we are targeting vaccination, more people to be vaccinated. Uh, I've been vaccinated first dose. Uh, so we need, we need money, right? We need uh, allocation in order to do that, in order to recover from this COVID-19. So we should not uh, focus on capital intensive measures in order to achieve this low carbon market. Uh, what because uh, the most important thing is for us to recover from COVID-19. <laughs> so we should target at the low-hanging fruits that are, that are available. And I would like to suggest to focus to five uh, segments that should be in our target. Uh, the first one is energy, like what uh, Jasmine mentioned just now. We should increase our energy efficiency and the usage of renewable energy. For water, we need to increase our water security and water management and we should also encourage uh, rainwater harvesting for waste we need to reduce the waste uh, participate in circular circular economy doing some upcycling uh, for mobility we should encourage people to use uh, public transportation when it is already okay to do so and cycling walking and other low carbon modes and also we should encourage uh, green greenery. And Jasmine mentioned that in the future, all jobs is going to be green. So there is no term of green jobs anymore. I, I, I really like that. Uh, so we should green our city, uh, build more parks so that uh, people could uh, reduce their stress. So that is all for me. Thank you, uh, Dr. So and Jasmine. So, um... Next question is from Sof Sofina Najib. I think this question is directly to Karin. What is the exact definition of zero poverty according to SDG? I think that there are still a lot of people living in poverty in Malaysia. Thanks, uh, Sofina, for that question. Um, you're right. There is definitely still a lot of people living in poverty in Malaysia. Um, but firstly, what's the exact definition of zero poverty according to the SDG? Um, if you look at the UN goals, you know, the, the goal for zero poverty is basically 
end poverty in all forms everywhere you know but but for me i look at it as more of a guideline you know the all 17 goals i look at, i look at it more as a guideline as a target to reach by 2030 you know so definitely there's still a long way to go um even in malaysia and in our neighboring countries as well all over asean there are still um people living in poverty so how um how can we actually help you know reduce poverty and i think the sdgs they're mostly about guidelines you know what what can we do by 2030 so one of them is by reducing poverty you know if it's zero poverty by 2030 then by all means that's the best news that anyone can hear but um poverty has existed for thousands of years i don't think we can solve it in in 10 years but what it is is a guideline for us to at least fight for it for um governments organizations to fight for um you know to fight towards zero poverty hey thank you karen okay this is the last question from betty this is an open question so what do you think the restriction of covid-19 upon executing sdg in malaysia in context of food security waste management and climate control I think right uh, now. Oh, sorry, Doctor. <laughs> so you want to go first? <laughs> no, just me. You I, I was first. just about to just give give a point on a green COVID recovery. Uh, because I think right now, um, we um globally have been have been experiencing COVID for the past more than one year now. Um, so dealing with covid is not something new uh, it should be something that we are already equip ourselves with supposedly la um, but then uh, when it comes to we're not, we're not looking at recovery measures right in the sense that how do we build back better from where we were and where we are now what is our recovery plan how do we look forward to the future and now i think um even though a year ago when covid happened it was a shock a total shock um throughout countries worldwide but now it is within our uh for example national um disaster risk management plan how do we handle the next pandemic when it happens because something that was was not for, uh, foreseen that before is something that we can expect to happen now uh which to think of it is very worrying um and again this is also the same pattern uh, that you can expect with climate change um and erratic weather events in future um so having a very robust um disaster risk management or recovery plan at hand um is a key first step towards actually adapting towards what's happening and also mitigating it um in the future um and Yeah, I think a doctor so you have some some things to add to it that. Thank you Jasmine. Uh not very much but I just would like to uh thank you for the question from Betty but I just would like to reiterate the three pillars of sustainability which is profit people and planet. So in order for us to recover from COVID-19 we must ensure that all uh, we must have a balanced approach. Uh, not to say about the restriction but of course we will have restriction we will have challenges but if we keep on thinking about the restriction we won't really uh, we could we couldn't move forward so we have to overcome this restriction uh, be creative and be innovative uh, but first we must ensure that there is food on the table we must help uh, the people and economy uh, we must help the people to stand back on their feet because there is no point of talking about saving the environment and climate change if you don't even have a uh, food on your table so it must be a balanced approach between these three pillars profit which is economy people and planet so i believe that we should have this balanced approach together with plan in order to mitigate and also adapt future possible pandemics or future scenario i agree with jasmine with that thank you Now maybe to um to wrap up I guess um um you know the pandemic the lockdown in particular has seen um lots of challenges for organizations for companies in terms of executing their plans in terms of you know 
contributing towards the SDGs. But again, um, this is an opportunity for everyone to be more innovative, be more um, proactive in thinking of solutions. But I would say as a, you know, as a closing remark, um, or to share my experience perhaps with Hunger Heads, um, the pandemic has definitely slowed us down in terms of um, executing projects when we have to meet beneficiaries, you know, distribute food packs, distribute um, essentials to them. Um, you know, we, 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 try, we always try to find a workaround, maybe perhaps reduce volunteers, but increase um, the number of visits, you know, so we can have the same impact, um, find local partners to help us um, with the distributions. But the restrictions of COVID-19, I think there's so many, there's, there's a lot that I can say, you know, but at the same time, there's still lots of um, opportunities that also arise because of the pandemic um, that directly um, relates to SDGs, you know, education. We have now better online learning platforms, um, food security. We have more and more organizations stepping up, you know, to fill, to fill, um, the whole of, of providing food packs, providing groceries to the um, people in the B40 community. So I think at the end of the day, there will always be restrictions, there will always be challenges, but it's how we approach these challenges that actually um, define how we um, execute the SDGs. Okay, thank you to all the speakers. Dear speakers and audience, we have come to the end of our sharing sessions. Thank you to Dr. Zul, Karin, and Jasmine for very and insightful sharing sessions. I hope everyone that is here tonight are able to comprehend new knowledge about SDG and apply it. With that, I apologize for any mistake throughout this whole session. Thank you again. This has been a fine session. Now I will pass the floor back to Master of Ceremony, Ms. Aina. Thank you, Isa Akila, and fellow speakers for a very insightful session. Dear audience, we have just released the link for Google Forms and the QR code. Hence, please fill in the Google Form for a certificate and scan the QR code provided for merit. Note that the name filled in the Google Form will be used to participate in the lucky draw. We would appreciate if participants can do it by 10.30 p.m., since we will stop accepting participations. Thank you everyone for your participation and attention. On behalf of the organizers, I would like to apologize for any mistakes. May the knowledge from this webinar can help you in future. As for our audience today, we will conduct a lucky draw session on our Instagram. 10 lucky winners will be able to receive grab food vouchers worth 150 ringgit. So stay alert. We would also we also would like to inform everyone here that Glocos will be conducting a very special competition soon. So follow our Instagram at Glocos9 to know more. Thank you so much, everyone from Glocos Bumi for you and me. That's all for today. Hope to meet you again in future. Bye.